He is the former ambassador of Indonesia to the United States and also the former vice minister of foreign affairs. And most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, he is the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. Please welcome Ambassador Dino Patijalal. Thank you very much, Minister Kari Jamaluddin, my good friend, Pak uh, Kishor Mahbubani, uh, Deputy Secretary General, Pak uh, Mohtar, my good friend, uh, Dirjen ASEAN, Pak Jose Tavares, uh, Ambassadors, uh, my dad, who's sitting in the back, <laughs> FPCR chapters, uh, uh, members of the general public uh, and all friends, thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, uh, this is, uh, has been said to be the world's largest foreign policy conference. So I think uh, we deserve Good. And I, I want to thank the FPCI chapter from all across Indonesia, the hundreds of volunteers here who work very hard and tirelessly to produce this conference. So thank you to all of them. And uh, I want to say also happy 50 years, ASEAN. Is my slides uh, on, on, on the screen? Oh, sorry. Happy 50 years, ASEAN. And uh, also I want to say happy 150 years to Canada uh, this year. Let's give a big hand to Canada. I think the ambassador is here someplace. Ambassador, thank you. Yeah. I uh, studied in Canada for five years. It's a very awesome country. Right? As we celebrate ASEAN 50 years, I think the last thing we should do is take it for granted. You know, 50 years ago, around the time when ASEAN was born, Southeast Asia was pretty messed up. You know, we had, uh, we had wars, we had proxy wars, we had confrontasi, interventions, genocide. We had insurgents, separatism, about four million people died in wars and conflicts in Southeast Asia in the 60s and 70s. Four million people, can you imagine that? You know, it was a very violent and divided region, not just geographically, but also ideologically. There was a lot of animosity and mistrust within Southeast Asia. Any country in this region would feel some degree of regional anxiety and insecurity towards another. And there was a lot of poverty as well. Singapore's per capita was about as low as Jamaica at the time. Now Singapore's per capita is about 27 times more than it was uh, in 1960s. So there was minimal contacts between uh, peoples uh, and dysfunctional regional cooperation. Uh, a lot of things that we tried just did not work. So in short, Southeast Asia was in a bad shape, you know, just like uh, this guy, you know, he looks uh, pretty beat up, right? Uh, 50 years later, ASEAN looks much better from this guy that looks beat up to become these guys, right? <laughs> By the way, that's uh, Kairi Jamaluddin, uh, Minister of Youth uh, in Malaysia on the right hand. Uh, we both were in a boy band together, but then Malaysia beat Indonesia in badminton, and I, I never spoke with him again since after that. <laughs> Back to ASEAN, you know, you know, the regional experiment called ASEAN indeed became a miracle. Beyond anyone's expectation, ASEAN 5 became 6, became 8, became 9, and finally became ASEAN 10. A divided region, became united, mistrust was replaced with cooperation, peace replaced war, cooperation replaced confrontation. And the social economic story was equally remarkable. ASEAN's population grew 350%. Life expectancy grew 15 years to 71 years. ASEAN GDP growth grew 108, 28 times. ASEAN's trade grew 228 times. ASEAN's income per capita grew 33 times from $122 to 
to about $4,000 in 2016. And this is probably going to continue because while ASEAN is getting older, ASEAN is also staying younger. I mean, if you look at this chart, most of ASEAN except Singapore and Thailand, sorry, Pak Kishore and Ambassador of Thailand, is uh, younger in median age compared to China, United States, UK, South Korea, France, Germany, and Japan. And this is something that is going to continue. ASEAN will remain relatively young until 2065. The yellows are ASEAN, and the blues are the non-ASEAN uh, countries. So in short, Southeast Asia has become a region of peace, progress, and cooperation. And ASEAN is one of the most successful regional organizations in the world. And what is the secret recipe for ASEAN success? By the way, that's not my wife, because <laughs> my, wi my wife and cooking are two entirely different things, right? So. Few things, secret recipe for ASEAN's success. One is equality. This is best embodied in the relationship between President Suharto and Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, one was leader of the largest country, the other one of ASEAN's smallest country. But both stood and, stood and sat as equals. No one was dominant, no one was subjugated, no one could force a decision on any other. And all decisions in ASEAN, in fact, are made by consensus. And the second recipe is pragmatism. In the European Union, for example, to become a member, you have to have political uniformity. You have to be a democracy, and you have to embrace free market. But ASEAN is a different model. In ASEAN, you have all sorts of political system. You have democracies, you have semi-democracies, you have socialist governments, you have communist governments, you have monarchies. ASEAN is very pragmatic. If you belong in this region, then we're gonna work with you and we're gonna try to solve uh, uh, problems. So that's pragmatism. And next is trust. Yeah, there was a time when Vietnam thought ASEAN was just a Western conspiracy, a Western concoction. There was a time when Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore had bad blood over confrontasi. And same problems with Malaysia and Philippines over Sabah. But for every problem they solved, for every agreement they signed, trust grew, confidence grew, faith in each other grew. And the other recipe is leadership. You know, ASEAN was not something driven at the, from the bottom, not by some NGOs or civil society. It was created at the top by top national leaders who make ASEAN top national priority. They design ASEAN, these leaders push ASEAN, and they elevated ASEAN. It's a top bottom leaders led process. They took the risk, they spent the political capital on building ASEAN, and they developed the visions for the region. They called it the ASEAN way, and they were not afraid to be different from other organizations. So these were the secret recipe, maybe not so secret, that led ASEAN to where it is today. But what about the next 50 years, right? What about the next 50 years, the next half century? In my view, the wisest thing to do for us is to avoid being complacent or overconfident. There's still a risk of ASEAN losing dynamism. There's a risk of ASEAN losing direction, eclipsed by bigger players, losing our game. Regeneration of leaders may complicate things. Nationalism within Southeast Asia may not always be compatible with regionalism. So what should be the secret of ASEAN for the next 50 years? Let me offer a few. One is coherence. As the ambassador of Thailand said, 
This is very important whenever ASEAN is pulled in different directions by outside powers, relations with fellow ASEAN has to take precedence over relations with countries outside ASEAN. ASEAN first, he's very right on that. ASEAN's interests, however you define it, must take priority. Secondly, grassrooting. I don't know if this is a word, but I'll make it a word anyways. You know, after five decades, because ASEAN is a top-down and sometimes elitist process, ASEAN still has not become household reality at the grassroots. In Indonesia, you know how many people know about the ASEAN economic community? And this is based on my tour across Indonesia and meeting university students and business people. I would say less than 1% would know what ASEAN economic community is about. I remember I had a conversation with Prime Minister Najib of Malaysia, and I asked him, what is Malaysia's figure on how many people would know? And he said, probably less than 5%. And I think that figure also works in this room. So as we saw from Man on the Street video, it was funny, but it was real. Uh, we have to get ASEAN more deeper to the bottom. And one example, of course, count how many ASEAN students are studying in Indonesia. Very, very minimal. And third thing is ASEAN has to become a genuine economic community. Uh, Intra-ASEAN trade is about 25%, it's pretty good. But if you look at Indonesia, there are quite a few provinces who don't trade at all with ASEAN, right? Isn't that strange? They're right next door, right? Trade is dominated by about seven or eight provinces out of 34, right? So we got a lot to do in making ASEAN a genuine economic community. And look at this chart, right? In ASEAN, six largest economies constitute 95% of ASEAN economies, right? There you see the scale. And ASEAN needs to figure out what is the next big vision. This is what I think is missing at the moment, right? Uh, sort of every generation of ASEAN leaders has come up with something huge, something visionary. And now after 2015, since the ASEAN community, that next big vision is still elusive. Now, in the last 50 years, each ASEAN country was dealing with nation building, with national identity, with national integ integrity. In, e in the next 50 years, each and every one of ASEAN countries will have to deal with globalization. And I tell you, globalization is back. Yeah. I am back. Globalization has brought us a strange and unfamiliar world. It is a world whereby the richest man in the world is a Mexican. It is a world whereby the most spoken language in the world is Chinese, not English. And I'm told that the largest English-speaking country in the world will also be Chinese in the coming decades. It is a world where Indian Bollywood is larger than Hollywood. It is a world where the largest producer of all is not the Middle East, but the United States. And then it is a world whereby the largest company buying airlines now is Lion Air, right? They're not sponsors, so they're not telling me to say this. <laughs> right. But globalization is experiencing stress now. Oh, is it also a world where China has more billionaires in the United States, yeah? Uh, globalization is having stress now. The world trade has slowed, yeah, since 2011. You see a lot of negative contractions in uh, trade. And you see also the number of protectionist measures being adopted by more and more countries. The blue are the number of pr protectionist measures until June 17, and the green is compared to 2015. And this is the number for G20 countries, which make up the majority of the world economy. Again, you see uh, the number of harmful protectionist measures rising dramatically through the years. Right. But I would say globalization is, again, 
in a stressful, beat up stage at the moment. However, I would like to stress that while globalization is slowing down, it is not in reverse. The people who say there is a period of deglobalization, I think that's not necessarily so because as you see here in the index, uh, information flow, people flow, capital and trade flow, they keep rising, but rising a lot slower, but they're not reversing. And as you see, cross-border data flow are still surging, surging and connecting more countries. Let me close with two points on globalization that I want the young people to know. First is that we Asians are ahead, which means what? Don't act like we are losing, right? This is a chart on who has gained most from globalization, right? Who gained most? The top 1% and the Asian middle class, right? So we are doing quite well. And look at this chart. I, I'm never tired of showing this chart. This is on how the world youth perceive globalization. And as you see, the countries where the young people are most positive to embrace globalization as positive for their future is China, 91%, India, 87%, Brazil, and so on. And the United States is at 71%. Even my friend said that this number is too high. But the point is, hey, these are the countries that you are competing with. If you are feeling pessimistic and lacking confidence, you are losing half the battle already. And the other thing is, I want to tell you the next big thing is upon us. In 1980, you know, I got a hold of my first email, but little that I know that that little machine would change the world forever. We had the internet economy, trillions of dollars of uh, money going into the world economy that changed everything, revolutionized everything. And what we have here now is the next big thing is upon us. Just as much as the next big thing was email, this time around it will be something more powerful. Artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, the internet of things, T 3D printing, fintech, driverless car, genomics, genetic editing, quantum computing, digitization, automation, and God knows what else. And I can't even tell you how this is gonna change our world the same way the internet and email change our world. But what I do know, it is a world of permanent and accelerated disruptions. And what I do know is this, as my final point, that this is a challenge for Indonesian foreign policy. It's not just the geopolitics, it's not just the trade and investment. It is how do we prepare for an era which is gonna be so disruptive that we need to find a way to effectively turn foreign policy into a tool to extract the coming resources of globalization. Right now, as in many other countries, the right hand, the left hand, the right leg, the left leg, the head are not talking to each other. Finance policies, information policies, foreign policy, labor policy, immigration policy, they are separated. We cannot afford this in the next big thing that would hit globalization. And I'm sure if we put our minds to it, we can finally have not just diplomacy bebas active, but also diplomacy bebas active and creative. I thank you very much for coming and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Dino Pati Jalal. Thank you, Ambassador Jalal, for your speech.